Come home to Jesus. This is the message that Max Solbrechen has proclaimed for 50 years to multitudes across the world. His crusades have taken him to the Hindus of India, Muslims of Pakistan, Buddhists of Sri Lanka, voodoo worshippers of Haiti, Catholics of Malta, and headhunters of northern Luzon. He has preached God's Word in stadiums, churches, tents, universities, and prisons. He comes to you today with the message of God's love and power. The man who is not afraid to preach the truth, Pastor Max Solbrechen. Oh, last night's service. Oh, yeah. I didn't know if we could overlive that last night. Wasn't it <laughs> all amazing? Just amazing. A number of people were delivered last night, and, and the miracles happened so easily last night. I said to, you know, today, God must have been really, really pleased with, with, with the service because the miracles were happening so easy. A lot of people that I did not know, and boy, they were getting miracles. And, uh, you know, just wonderful, just wonderful. Uh, I don't know if you, many of you know Dougie Pruden. Do you know Dougie Pruden? The, the push-up man? Yeah, I know him. Well, Dougie Prudham, you know, he he was saved in our ministry when he was just just a teenager and um, came to Christ. And and he's different, but he's a, he's a different kind of a guy. But he's a push-up man as a world, um, all kinds of uh, things, uh, you know, Guinness World Records, the, the most push-ups in the world. Traveled all over the world. He came here with his mother last night. Now his mother is strong Catholic, and uh, and I didn't wonder what if she would ever come, but she had been ill, and so he asked me to pray for her a few weeks ago, and she was getting better. So she said, I think she said that this, you know, this gospel is pretty good. So he brought her last night. And uh, she gave her heart to the Lord, and, and I prayed for her. Wasn't that wonderful? <clears throat> a, a, a number of things were happening like that that you didn't know about. But let's just read from the scripture here, shall we? And let's turn to Luke's gospel, the third chapter. And let me read from Luke 3 and verse number 16. And John answered and said unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's what we need. We need the fire. We need the power of God and the fire of God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Father, that the power of the living God will be upon us today as it was last night in, 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 in each service for the last two weeks. I thank you for your goodness and mercy. And now, Father, I pray that you will just touch every heart and every life and, and that you will heal the sick that are here today, Lord, as you did last night. And I pray now, Father, that you will just bless this ground and bless this area and let a revival be the fruit of these tent meetings. We ask this for Christ's sake, for God's glory. Everyone, would you shout a great big amen? amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Before I share the message, I want to just share something here. Um, it was William Booth who said, I set myself ablaze for God. And men come to watch me burn. I set myself ablaze for God. And men want to watch me burn. Abraham Lincoln said, I want my preacher to act like he's fighting a swarm of bees when he's preaching that was Abraham Lincoln. I want my preacher to act like he was fighting a swarm of bees. <laughs> wow. When he's preaching. William Booth said, there have been more than enough conferences and congresses and committees 
and deliberations. It's time to act. There is not a moment to lose. No more doubt. No more delay. Arise, ye children of the light, and buckle on the armor of light. The armor bright. And now, prepare yourselves to fight against the world and Satan. We are called to fight with him, for him. With every particle of strength we have to the last grasp, that is enough. On being interviewed by King Edward VII, William Booth was asked to write something in the King's personal autograph book. This was in 1904. By this time, William Booth was an older man. He sat down at the table to write something in the king's personal autograph book. And the king said, how are the churches treating you now, General Booth? Because they used to make fun of him. He called themselves General. They, used, they fought him. The churches all fought him. Army, Salvation Army. It was the lowest of the low. And the king said, how are they treating you now, General Booth? He said, now they're copying me. <laughs> they're imitating me. And the king said, that's wonderful. Write something in my book. And he pulled back that long beard, that white beard, and sat down. And with his writing instrument, he wrote these words. Your majesty, some men's ambition is art. Some men's ambition is gold. Some men's ambition is fame. But my ambition is the souls of men. Amen. The souls of men. The souls of men. He said, if I had my way, I wouldn't send out a single Salvation Army preacher until first I had tied him over the mouth of hell for 24 hours and let him hear the screams and the groans that come from hell and then I would release that soldier to go and save the world for Jesus Christ when the governor of A state in Australia said to him, General Booth, I'm going to give you a thousand pounds. When do you want? He said, now. <laughs> he got out his book and wrote the check right now. He said, now. <laughs> the Salvation Army. We don't have many men like that around anymore. George Whitfield said, give me souls or take mine. The greatest need is more tears. Whitfield, one of the greatest preachers at the time of John Wesley. At first, uh, Whitfield thought that John Wesley was kind of going overboard because when John Wesley had started the Methodist Church, when he began to, to have those great big crusades, you know, he, the history of John Wesley. John Wesley was an Anglican minister who had gone to the 13 states in the USA. And he realized he was there to convert them, but he himself was not converted. And on the ship going back to England, he got scared, and he met some people called the Moravians. This church was built by the Moravians. And the Moravians were not afraid in the storm. And the Anglican clergyman, John Wesley, said, why aren't you afraid to die? The storm is pretty awful. Well, they said, we know Jesus. Well, he said, I'm a preacher. I don't know Jesus. 
And he went back to London and went to their meetings and got to know Jesus. Amen. And he began to preach it. He began to preach it. And it wasn't long before the Anglican church threw him out. He was preaching born again. Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah? And he went out into his father into the graveyard around the church and stood on his father's tombstone. Said, We own this property. I can preach here. So he stood on his father's tombstone and preached his first message. And they said, now you've lost your parish. What will you do? He said, the world is my parish. And he began to preach and call pastors. And soon he had up to 50,000 people to hear him preach. John Wesley, marvelous man of God. John Wesley. And when his preachers were getting cold and needed a revival, he said, I want you to read David Brainerd. Read David Brainerd. And David Brainerd was the man who had gone to India as a missionary. He died at the age of 29. He prayed so much that his heart moved from the left side to the right side. And he died of a broken heart. 3,000 Hindus came to his funeral. David Brainerd. David Brainerd. And he wrote, I cared not where or how I lived or the hardships I went through. so that I could but gain souls for Christ. Pardon me. I've got my story mixed up. There's David Brainerd and there's, there's John Hyde. It was John Hyde who went to England. But David Brainerd was in the U.S. among the American Indians. Excuse me. There were two of us that were perfect until now. And now I guess been. I guess, what's his name? Ben, not Benedict, but what's the other guy's name? Francis is the only one who's still perfect. <laughs> anyway, I made a mistake. It was John Hyde who went to India. It was David Brainerd who went to the American Indians. And he died. Actually, he, he had tuberculosis. He tramped through the snow. And sometimes he would be in snow up to his chest. And he prayed so hard that the snow melted around him. It was John Hyde who died of a broken heart. It was, it was, um, it was uh, David Brainerd who died of tuberculosis. But he reached the Indians of America. He said, I could, I cared not where or how I lived or the hardships I went through so that I could but gain souls for Christ. When I was asleep, I dreamt of those things. When I was awake, the first thing I thought of was this great work. All my desire was for the conversion of the heathen and all my hope was in God. John Wesley said to his preachers, you're tired of preaching? Read David Brainerd. It's a life story. And you'll get back preaching again. When he first went to the American Indians, he uh, couldn't find anyone that was sober. They were on the fire water. And he preached through a drunken Indian who knew English. And when the, he preached and this drunken Indian interpreted, the revival broke loose. 
Come on, clap your hands. Say hallelujah. Revival broke loose. Because it's God's word that does the job. Can you say amen? It's God's word. It's God's word. I was over there in British Columbia when I first got converted. I I was working for Swift Canadians selling meat. We used to say, we sell everything. We sell beef and, and we pigs. And the only thing that we don't sell on the hog, we sell everything but the squeal. We can't sell that. And I got converted and I began to, to testify for Jesus. It was awesome. It was awesome. We lived in Prince George, British Columbia, and God, through a set of circumstances, I found out that I lost a promotion with Swifts to be a to be a supervisor in the Kootenays. I found out, and they had lied to me and told me I could be the president, and I couldn't even be a supervisor. Because they said he's too religious. Too religious for to talk with other salesmen. Too religious. And I said, Lord, if that's... They told me I could be the president. I can't even be a supervisor. If you got something better for me, let me know. And a year later, God gave me a job with McCormick Biscuits, where I earned three times as much money, where I had all kinds of time off, where I preached and held revivals as well as my job for six years. I was in Prince Rupert, and I got to know the native people, the Indian people, and they opened their doors to me, and I preached all over their villages, on weekends and things like that. And when I was at Prince Rupert, I was I went to the Friendship House, the Native Friendship House at Prince Rupert. I remember I used to go there and I made so much money. I made a lot of money and I had a lot of customers, 300 customers. And uh, I remember the Lord would say to me, now you have had your supper at, in the Grand Restaurant on, on 3rd Avenue in Prince Rupert. It goes down into a valley. They call it Apache Pass because all the Indians hung out down there. The Apache Pass. And he said, now you go and feed the people. So I'd walk down there and I would stand on the corner and I lift my New Testament and I would shout hallelujah three times. And Brother Adamanchuk, he was a new Ukrainian man. He was a deacon in the Pentecostal church. He was a Ukrainian man married to a native Indian woman. And he heard me blocks away and he came down to stand with me. And I began to preach. And people, I went down at 9 o'clock when the when the movie had just let out and the other one was going in and the ones going in stopped and came down to hear me and the ones coming out and we had a crowd and I was preaching and I looked across and I had a, a restaurant or I had a, a delicatessen there. They bought stuff for me and they were Italians and this lady had her apron on and she came down and she said, give them hell, Max. And I was preaching, and she was across the street telling me to go for it. It was something else. It really was something else. And on that same street corner, the Salvation Army captain used to go down there every Saturday. And there were hotels that were right up next to the street. You know, one of those areas. 
And this Salvation Army captain would go down there, and just he and his wife, and the, another guy, a drummer, and they would walk down to the three of them, and he would preach. And one night, on a Saturday night, I believe it was, when uh, the Salvation Army captain was standing there preaching, and, and a lumberjack had just come off from the lumber camp, and he got drunk, and he was sleeping. And he was awakened by the Salvation Army, and he became angry. Now this Salvation Army captain would preach and every Saturday night there was one man who would come and kneel at the drumhead, but nothing happened week after week. And this particular Saturday night, this Salvation Army captain, they had been beating the drums and blowing the horns and, and he was preaching and this drunken lumberjack awakened, was angry. And he took a basin of cold water and opened the window. And he threw it down. And it hit the captain in the head. And he said, praise the Lord, brother. And he bent over. And this man was so angry, he got another basin of water, cold water, and dumped it, and it went right down his neck. And he said, God bless you, brother. And at that moment, a miracle happened. The man that he had tried to get through for maybe a year or so fell at the drumhead and got saved. And never drank again. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. The grace of God. The miracle of God. You don't know when it will happen. Just that act of grace. And God broke through that alcoholic. And I remember as I was leaving, it was the early 1960s, and I left McCormick's in 1963. This must have been about 1961. And I went down, I was over the weekend in Prince Rupert, British Columbia, going to deadhead back on the Monday after I finished my work there. And all of a sudden, I saw a man walk in, and I could tell he was a clergyman because he was dressed like a clergyman. And as he walked in, I saw him coming, and I'm not sure what was happening. I wasn't preaching yet. They were singing, I think. And he walked up to me, and he said, I'm Dean Patterson of St. Matthew's Anglican Cathedral. You're Max Solberg. And I said, I am. He said, I have come here tonight to ask your forgiveness. I said, well, why? He said, well, I've been very much against you. I have had a terrible feeling about you and because you've been coming here and having some revivals and I have a number of native people coming to our church and they've been going to your meetings and they're coming back and saying they're born again and saying they've been filled with the Holy Spirit and it's causing a lot of confusion. And it's been bothering me a lot. It was so bad, he said, that I went to see Dr. Elliot of the United Church said, what should we do about Max Solbrick and the McCormick Biscuit commercial traveler who is coming here and causing disruption in our churches? 
And Dr. Elliot said, Dean Patterson, I don't believe we should do anything to Max Solbrick and the McCormick biscuit salesman. <laughs> he said, why not? Well, Dean, I believe that he has something you and I don't have. And he said, that really upset me. I didn't know what to do. I went to the cathedral. And I was all alone. And I went right to the altar and I laid down. I laid down in the form of a cross on my face below the cross. And I said, Lord, what does Max Solbrick in the McCormick Biscuit commercial traveler have from you that Dr. Elliot and I don't have? And he said, I don't know how long I laid there on my face weeping and crying so upset, so hurt, and not knowing what to do. And all of a sudden, this Holy Spirit fell upon me. And I began to speak in other tongues. And I was filled with the Holy Ghost. Can you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. And he said, for a while, the people tolerated it. The born again experience and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But after a while, after a while, he said they decided they didn't want me. So I've been asked to leave the Anglican Church. And I'm going tomorrow morning. My family and I were leaving for Seattle to join with Father Dennis Bennett of the Episcopalians, the first Episcopalian who had received the Holy Spirit in the U.S. So I said, would you like to talk to the people? And he did and told them. So then we took an, after I finished preaching, I took a little love offering for him and drove up. It was midnight. Drove up to his home. And the lights were, all, were out and I put the envelope in his mailbox. And then I began to hear stories about the work he was doing in Seattle among the Anglicans, the Episcopalians. It was touching. Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Can you lift up your hands and shout hallelujah? hallelujah? I want you all to say these words after me. We are the church. We are the church. Sheep, of Sheep of one flock. Stones in one building. Stones in one building. Branches, in one vine. Branches in one vine. Limbs in one body. In one body. Washed in one blood. Wow. The, blood the blood of Jesus. Lights of one light. Of one light. Epistles of one book. The Holy, the Holy Bible. Nourished by one word. Baptized into one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Servants of one master, Jesus Christ our Lord. Led by one Lord. Bone of his bone. Flesh of his flesh. Body of his body. One with Christ. We are the church. Lift up both of your hands and shout hallelujah. Can you say praise the Lord? Let's all stand to our feet. I want to read a portion of God's word here and bring a brief message. I want to read from the book of John's gospel. The book of John's gospel. I want to read from the third chapter of the book of John's gospel. I'd like to read from verse number 14 as follows. In Jesus' name. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It will say saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Precious Jesus. Precious Jesus. Shall we bow, please, for prayer? Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you because you're here with us now. You're not ashamed to be with us. <laughs> We're thrilled to be with you. Why would you ever call us, Lord? Why would you ever come down to this sin-cursed earth to die for the garbage of this world? You died on the garbage dump in, out of Jerusalem there. You died on Golgotha where people would bring their garbage. You died for us, the world's garbage. We were nothing. Sinners lost and dying without hope. And then, Jesus, you came to rescue us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone say, thank you, Jesus. You may be seated, please. I'm going to take about 15 minutes to share with you. Why is Jesus so important to me? And the first reason he's so important to me is because of his great love. Why is he important to me and my family? Why is he important to the church? Why is he important to the world? Because of his great love for us. No one has ever loved you like Jesus. No one. My brother Fred passed away. I mentioned it last night. My brother Fred passed away. and We just opened the camp meeting on the Saturday. And they wanted me to come to Vancouver to Abbotsford to take his funeral. So we couldn't be here for that first Sunday. We, Donna and I flew down, and I talked with his wife. She said, speak to Dan, one of his sons. And so I called Dan, and, and we talked. I said, I'm so sorry that your father is gone, and my brother. He said to me two months ago, my dad and I had a serious talk in the hospital. He knew he was dying. And he said to me, Dan, I'm not afraid to die because I know Jesus. And I said, that's the key to my message. At the funeral, at the funeral determined and also at the memorial. I'm not afraid to die because I know Jesus. 
And I said, what is it so important about knowing Jesus that takes away the fear of death? What is it? What is it about Jesus that can remove the fear of dying? What is it? No one has ever loved you like Jesus. And I shared, how do you get to know this Jesus? Who is he? And how did you get to know him? It was awesome. The burial service and also the memorial service there was between 150 and 200 people. And the power of God just came down. And like I did last night, I had everyone stand and pray the sinner's prayer. I did that at the funeral. I don't conduct a funeral now unless I make a prayer and everyone pray the sinner's prayer. And in that sinner's prayer, I make the confession of faith of who Jesus is. Why he's so important? <laughs> because he is God the Son who came down and was incarnated. God in human flesh. To suffer and to bleed and to die for the sins of the world. You say, Pastor Max, you're always preaching about Jesus. I said, yes, I am. They said to D.L. Moody, you've preached now for seven nights from John 3, 16. When will you stop it? He said, when you do what John 3, 16 says, I'll stop it. Can you say hallelujah? <laughs> Glory to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He wants us to come. He wants to come into us and live in us. He wants to give us his name, give us his power, give us his life. We sing the song, and Billy Graham used to always sing it, and we still love to sing it just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. And at the funeral, at the burial, I shared for about 20 minutes. We had about maybe 70 people. My brother Fred had six children. I didn't know, know how it was with those children. But I had this message from their dad, the grandfather. I'm not afraid to die because I know Jesus. Him to know is life eternal. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, shall be saved, shall go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. I give my life for my sheep. I am the true vine. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believed on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I said, your dad is alive. He's in the arms of Jesus. They hugged me. Donna, sweetheart, stand up. My beautiful wife, Donna, stand up and light up the place. Welcome her. She has not been feeling well the last while, but she's here. Hallelujah. 
Can you say praise the Lord? This cold had tried to grip her, but it had to go. Someone say hallelujah. Raise up your hands and shout hallelujah. At the memorial service, then I took my liberty. But 150 to 200 people. The power of God fell and I preached this message. And we had them all stand. All prayed the sinner's prayer. And in that, our confession of who Christ is. And then I prayed the Lord's Prayer. They prayed it with me. And then I pronounced the benediction. And then I said, I feel like singing. And they were just standing there wanting more. And I said, who can sing? Someone said, Karen can sing. Come on up here, Karen. Doug, come on up here. Dan, come on up here three of Fred's children I said we're going to sing hallelujah everybody knows that chorus if you don't know I'll teach you and so we sang it about five or six times hallelujah 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 Christ is coming Christ is coming Christ is coming Christ is coming they all loved it. They hugged us. They said it's more like a revival service than a funeral. Someone say hallelujah. Slip up your hands and say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And now I'm writing a little, little booklet. I, I'm not afraid to die. I know Jesus, my friend, is so broken. And it'll go all over the world. Can you say praise the Lord? He wants to come into us. He said, come unto me, all you labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3.20. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I want to come in. The sad part is that the Laodicean church was so backslidden and so cold. And that's a picture of the church today. So backslidden. That Jesus was put on the outside. Wanting to come into his own church. I'm standing and I'm knocking on your door church. Will you let me in? He wants to come in. Another truth. He's the heavy lifter. Come unto me all you who. Labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come unto me, all you are tired and weary and sick of life and sick of being sick and tired and sick of your sin. Come unto me, all you labor and are heavy laden. You say, I can't go another day. Jesus said, come unto me. All you labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. You know, when you walk with Jesus, just take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For I am meek and humble of heart. You shall find rest for your souls. When you're yoked with Jesus, he carries the load. But when you're a sinner... And you're yoked to the devil. He laughs while you carry the load. Did you ever think of that? He, you think you have a good time. He's laughing his head off. He knows you're going to get cancer. He knows you'll get herpes. He knows you'll get AIDS. He knows you'll die of alcoholism. So he laughs his head off. And then 
you end up in the gutter and you're carrying the load all by yourself. And you're yoked to him. He's still laughing. I got you now. I've got you now. Not so fast, devil. We're preaching the gospel. Right at the last moment, we can reach him. Can you say hallelujah? All he's got to do is say Jesus. That's all. Jesus. Just cry out to Jesus. Backslider, cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. He will clean you up and change you. He's, that's not all, but he'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. He'll fill you. He said, Behold, I give unto you power over all the power of the enemy. Ye shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost is upon you. Ye shall be filled with my spirit, my presence. Take my gospel. Take my name. Take my word. And go into all the world and preach the gospel. And heal the sick and cast out devils. And raise the dead. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. He gives us power over the devil. Luke 10 and 17, and they returned and they said, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven, and now I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Don't be afraid. Nothing, nothing. So the enemies hurt you. He gives us his peace and his joy. John 14, 27. My peace I give unto you. My peace I leave with you. Let not your heart be troubled. He gives us joy. He gives us wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. He's made unto us wisdom. Wisdom, Christ, has made unto us righteousness and wisdom. He gives us his name. He gives us his gifts. He protects us. Romans 8. He protects us by his word, by his name. I'm going to close. I said 15 minutes. I'm pretty well right on. Mark that down. That's a miracle. Can you say hallelujah? Slip up your hands and say hallelujah. It's the eighth chapter of Romans, and it says here, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. There's freedom. Say freedom. Shout freedom. 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 And then it says here in Romans 8, and I'm going to close with this. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Devil, hear this. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Can you say hallelujah? Because we're free. For 50 years, Pastor Max Solbrecken has awakened the conscience of his audiences through the anointed proclamation of the claims of Christ who said, No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. The truth is, you are either for him or against him. You cannot remain neutral. Great costs are involved in spreading of Christ's gospel. Please consider investing in this ministry. Contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM, Box 44220, RPO, Garside, Edmonton, Alberta. T5V1N6 Canada.
You have been watching the Come Home to Jesus television ministry with Canada's preacher man, Dr. Max Solbrecken, who has proclaimed the Word of God across the world for 50 years without fear or favor of man or devil. Ask for Canada's revival magazine, The Cry of His Coming, when you write. Invest in souls by supporting this end time ministry. Please contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM Box 44220, RPO Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. Oh, die again.